What's up guys? Today we are doing a close reading of a literary text that I actually read for one of my college classes. It's a letter written by Gloria Ansaldúa. Together we'll annotate the first half of this text step by step since this is part one of this video, and in my next video I'll annotate the second half of the text. Just a quick note before we start, this text is meant for older readers since it deals with mature themes and it does include some profanity and graphic descriptions. This video is meant for high school students and above, so please keep this in mind before choosing to watch. So the text we're going to be reading was written by Gloria Anzaldúa, who was a leader of the Chicana feminist movement. But to learn a little bit more about this movement, we have to learn about the larger Chicano movement. So this was a civil rights movement in the 1960s in which Mexican Americans fought for farm workers' rights, land restoration, education reform, and a multitude of other issues in the United States. And the coalition of Chicanos included labor unions such as the United Farm Workers, as well as youth groups. And the Chicana movement kind of started as an offshoot of the Chicano movement, and it began in the late 1960s to the 1970s. And this movement allowed Mexican American women to spotlight stereotypes and issues surrounding class, ethnicity, sexuality, uh, and other topics that weren't necessarily addressed in the Chicano movement. So a really important characteristic of the Chicanas is that they critically analyzed the Chicano movement and the feminist movement that was happening at the time because they didn't really feel like, as women of color, that they fit into either group. So Gloria Anzaldúa was a really famous Chicana feminist writer, and she focused a lot on the intersectionality of her various identities because she identified as a writer, an activist, a poet, lesbian, and mestiza, so she really tried to explore all of these different aspects of her multifaceted identity, which we will see in the text that we're about to read. The text we're going to be reading is Speaking in Tongues, a letter to third world women writers by Gloria Anzaldúa. So throughout this video, I will display each page of the text. You can pause the video and read the text on your own, maybe even annotate it, then resume the video to see my step-by-step -step annotations. You can pause the video now, and I'll get started. First off, the author directly addresses her readers as mujeres de color, women of color, and hermanas, or sisters, to highlight her own bilingual identity by weaving Spanish into the letter. In the first paragraph, we can see imagery describing the author's imagined readers, or different examples of women of color who are trying to write. There's also an image of oppressive heat when she describes the Chicana fanning away mosquitoes and the hot air, so this heat may represent how society often stifles or smothers the voices of women of color. In the sentence that I've underlined, the author is rebelling against the strict writing rules taught by the mainstream education system, which often suppresses women of color. This is evident in her choice of words, since she says that school brainwashed esoteric BS and pseudo-intellectualizing into her writing, suggesting that school often teaches us to pontificate or make really superficial work as opposed to writing things that people actually want to read. In this paragraph, the author contrasts the experiences of white women with those of women of color, since many minority women do not have the same privileges that white women have in terms of socioeconomic status, education, and other areas. This is the first instance in which the author distances herself from the white feminist movement. The author then refers to her own title, saying that we speak in tongues like the outcast and the insane. This idea of speaking in tongues refers to the language or form of writing that third world women writers have created to express themselves, because popular language usage usages often fail to fully encapsulate their ideas. The idea of speaking in tongues is evident in the mixed or varied quality of the text, which we will see next. The author includes a poem by Sherry Moraga, another famous Chicana writer, in this letter to defy literary norms. I mean, who said that a letter has to be just one continuous body of text with no other elements thrown in? The author adds poetry, quotes from other writers, and her own journal entries into this letter to not only spotlight the voices of other third world women writers, but to also prove that there is no one correct way to craft a piece of writing. In this poem by Sherry Moraga, 
A metaphor compares words to a war to show how language is used to categorize and demean the narrator's family. For example, the narrator's mother is characterized as an unintelligible illiterate, a really apathetic phrase that does not sum up the mother's identity at all. By writing these lines, the narrator is appropriating or taking the oppressor's language to find her own words. She is using the very language, English, that is used to demean her family in order to rebel against systemic discrimination. In the next paragraph, the author includes rhetorical questions, which highlights her stream of consciousness technique. This means that she is writing down her thoughts as they come to her mind, which contributes to the personable, intimate tone of the letter. You can pause this video now, and I'm going to get started. In this paragraph, Ansaldúa uses a sarcastic tone to show that she will not change her identity to conform to the patriarchy's expectations. After all, others often expect women of color to hide the parts of their identity that make them who they are, such as their sexual orientation or their socioeconomic class, in order to fit in. In the section I've underlined, the author criticizes the literary elite, or the society of mainly male writers who use sophisticated literary devices such as frames and metaframes to belittle other writers who forego these devices for the sake of clarity. This section directly tackles harmful stereotypes of women of color by calling them out. The author depicts images in which women are the submissive victims of violation and violence to show that women, women of color have the power to destroy or debunk these stereotypes, and this makes them dangerous in the eyes of the patriarchal literary elite. The author also uses profanity because men themselves often use these vulgar words to demean women, so the author is showing that women can reclaim this language as well as their own sexuality. In this highlighted passage, the author similarly rebels against the idea that women of color are pieces of property and issues a rally cry for these women. Next, the author writes about the exclusion and tokenism of women of color within the white feminist movement. The author criticizes many, not all, feminists for focusing on the rights of white middle-class women and ignoring minority women or using women of color as the face of their social campaigns or as a charity case of sorts. Basically, the author wants women of color to know that it is not their responsibility to educate white feminists. The author also includes a quote from another writer who depicts the struggles, financial and otherwise, that women of color face which other writers do not have to worry about. Now that we've finished part one of this video, comment down below with any specific themes you found in the text based on our close reading. Stay tuned for part two of this video and remember to subscribe and tap the bell to receive notifications whenever I make a new tutorial. See you next time.